Hi, my name is Kelly Kane, and I am with Scissors Make Sense Salon Education, and you are listening to This Week in Small Business podcast. Kelly, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, tell us a bit about yourself. How did you get started? Do what you're doing. How are you where you are today? <laughs> Yeah. So um, as I said, my name is Kelly and I own a hair salon in Richmond, Virginia. I've been there for about 15 years. It is a multi-location, seven-figure business. Um, and through the years of people seeking me out for advice for various reasons as to how I made my salon successful, I created Scissors Make Sense Education, where I consult with other salon owners on how to successfully run their business, but also find joy and fulfillment in the process. Amazing. I actually understand you wrote a book. Which is... I did write a book. Yeah. So that was the first step in all of this where, you know, yeah. I had enough people reaching out for information and I was like, gosh, how do I deliver this to a lot of people? So I was going to start it as an ebook, um, something that people could easily download, but it, it ended up becoming a full blown book that was published and available pretty much anywhere you can buy a book. Amazing. That, I mean, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let me just ask you a series of questions and um, we just love, you know, just you've done such an interesting, had such an interesting journey. Um, you know, how would you help us along double its customer base? If that was kind of the, the mission that it needed, what, how do you get to the started on that journey? To doubling the customer base? Um, yeah. You know, that's, there's a lot that goes into that. So if I went all the way to the very beginning, I would say we have to get very clear on your branding. And I think people think of that as logo and decor, but really it's who you are and what is it that you want people to say about you as like a reputation if they're talking to their mom, their sister, their girlfriends. Um, so that's number one. And then, you know, really just um, dialing in social media, tapping into what that branding looks like, making sure the messaging is consistent through website, social media and referrals is huge. So I think that's the biggest piece of if you're really looking to kind of double what you're doing is maximize what you already have and try to double that versus looking outside of that and trying to bring new people in. So how do you, how do you weaponize referrals? How do you turn that into more than just good luck, but something that you can really lean into? Mm -hmm. You know, the way I think referrals work best is to really lean into the client that you think is your ideal client and then let them know you're my favorite client. I love when you come in. So I would love more of you. If you've got friends who are just like you, um, please spread the word because I'm trying to build my book. I think anytime you lead with something like that and you let a person know, I really value you. I love you. They're going to instantly think, really? Like, wow, thank you so much. And they're going to take that and then run with it to try to help you out. So I think, again, just really utilizing the people that you have in your chair that you want. And I think it's great because it allows you to customize your book because there might be some clients that you don't feel that way about. So right. you really want to lean into the ones that are, you know, if I had a hundred of you, I would have mm -hmm. the best clientele ever. I love that. Yeah. I mean, we've, I've heard from a lot of a lot of folks in, in you know, especially um, the, the beauty and wellness industry, that the, the act of kind of quote unquote firing a client can be just mm -hmm. as important to your business as hiring them. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, glad to hear that. <laughs> glad to hear how that comes up. Tell me, when when you get to your the scale that you are, how does your role, how does your role evolve over time? Like, what are the chapters in your own growth as as a business owner? in the industry. Tell us a bit about how that, how people should expect that to evolve in their own journey. Yeah. I mean, when I first started off, I had a very small team. It was just me and one other person. And so I was carrying a lot of that revenue. So I was spending most of my time behind the chair producing as the yeah. business grows and you bring in more team members, it requires more of you as a leader. And so that's where it gets really challenging is you have to think of, you have two roles in your business. You're a producer as well as the business owner. And it's not that your business owner duties are in addition to your job. So depending on the size of your team and the size of your revenue is really going to depend how much time you put into producing and how much time you're going to put into running the business. So I like to say if you're, you know, at zero to 250K, you might be more like 80% producing, 20% admin. Um, and then it just continues to grow. It can go 50-50. Then you might be doing more 20-80. And then where I'm at in business, I would say you're about 100% more in the operations. Um, yeah. I do still take a few clients just mainly because they're people that I would do over my kitchen sink. Um, yeah. But the reality is most of the time that I spend on business now is um, running the business versus working in the business. 
And what were some of the first things that you gave away or you replaced yourself with as you started shifting your percentage from producer to, you know, administrator or ops leader, or mm -hmm. however you want to frame it? Yeah. I mean, the first thing is you've got to reduce your hours behind the chair. And so in doing so, um, the key is I think a lot of times people reduce their hours, but they don't increase their price per hour of what they're charging. And so if I was working 40 hours behind the chair and I wanted to decrease that by 10 hours and be more like 30 and put those 10 hours in working on the business, I have to then make the same amount of money in 30 hours that I was making in 40 because just because I'm not producing doesn't mean I shouldn't get paid for my full-time job. So that's number one. And then taking some of my clientele that now doesn't want to pay those higher prices and funneling them down to my younger, less expensive um, stylist. And that's a really great way to utilize a funnel system in the business to have your upper tiered stylist build the books of your younger stylist. And tell me a little bit about the mindset shift mm -hmm. that you have to go through on that journey. I mean, a lot of people have trouble letting go. <laughs> maybe, maybe, or maybe wasn't the case for you, but tell me about how you're even the way you thought about yourself um, changed on that journey, maybe where it was toughest. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest mindset shift is that, you know, you go into it at first and you're like, okay, I need people to work for me. And the reality is the mindset is that I'm working for them. It's my job to keep them happy because if I'm always serving my team, then they're going to be better serving the clients. And so if I always say it's kind of like happy stylist equal happy clients, which therefore yeah. equal a happy leader. And so it's really reverse engineering. I think a lot of times we put ourselves at the top when really we're kind of at the, you know, we're the last, as they say, um, one of my favorite quotes is leaders eat last. And that's really the way it is. And so um, mm -hmm. that was mindset shift. Number one is that my full time role is serving my team and not the other way around. Yeah, I totally, I to totally resonates. Yeah. Um, and how did the way in which you hired your team as you started scaling change? Mm -hmm. You know, in the beginning, I think we all hire out of desperation because it's like, I need team, I need people to produce. And so we don't really fully think about what that ideal person looks like. And we just bring people on. And, you know, you're always scrambling because I used to say before I had policies, I was managing all the time and we fear policies. But once I put those in place and hired on those agreements, I very rarely have to, you know, execute anything because they know what's expected. And so I think that's what changed is now I only hire if they're a complete right fit for me and I'm a right fit for them. Whereas in the earlier days, it was like I would take anyone and everyone who came in because I felt that desperation for the production. And, you know, as you've shifted this kind of hiring, what, what kind of mistakes, what's the biggest mistake that it led you to make that you've now learned as you've kind of had, you know, this, this shifting role for yourself, but you're actually hiring in different ways. What are some of the mistakes you bumped into on that path? Yeah. I mean, I think in the beginning it was like, I'm going to hire people just like me so that I don't ever have to lead. And that was just so much naivety is like, nobody is going to be just like me. No one's going to be just like you. And so yeah. I kind of went into it thinking I wouldn't have to manage or lead anyone because I was going to hire them like me and we would all work the same way. Um, and that's just not reality. So I had to learn very quickly from that mistake that I very much did need policies, non-negotiables, expectations, and that really people want to be led. I think they respect you more when you do have that all well thought out and planned. And so, like I said, in the beginning, without it, I thought things would be easy. Um, but the reality is you need those things. It's easier actually having policies and non-negotiables in place from the very beginning. And how do you, how do you make those expectations known? So I am a little different than most people. Most people do that on day one of employment. I actually do it in the interview. So I like to sit down and kind of put it all on the table and say, this is who I am. And I basically have them sign up for me. So instead of me making a job offering, I'm like, this is my company, my core values, my mission, my purpose. And this is everything that I expect from your employment. And if that sounds good to you, you're my person. And if it's overwhelming or too much, or you don't want to sign up for it, we're probably not the right fit. Because I do believe they're choosing me just as much as I'm choosing them. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't usually give them a copy of that until day one of hiring, but I do set it yeah. all out there in the, in the very beginning um, to make sure that we're on the same page and that I am also what they're looking for. How do you test for something like that? I mean, especially like values and, and how you want you know, your, your business to be run through the people. How do you actually pick up on that before you make that hiring decision? I mean, let's be real. Everyone who sits down in an interview, you know, presents the best version of themselves. So after about three to six months is when you can really see 
what you what you hired, you know, because everybody can can sell you a story. But, you know, we have qualifying questions that we ask. I like to look for red flags. I'm always asking about previous employment um, experiences. I definitely like to ask, what is it that you are looking for in a leader to make sure it lines up with really who I am and what I have to offer? Um, you know, so a lot of qualifying questions. And then if they do call me back after that, because I leave the ball in their court, I typically have them come in after that and do a skill set demo so that we can see where their skill is at. That's not necessarily to say whether they're good enough or not to work for the company, but it does let me know at what level I can put them at and where I need to invest in education. Um, and yeah. we have them spend time with the team. And I really like to observe how they interact. Are they someone who will jump in and grab a load of tiles and throw them in the washer or are they just sitting back and observing and you know there's a lot of different ways you can qualify a person to see if they're a right fit and do you ever do the same with customers do you ever have a sense of a customer walks in and you're like this is going to be tough or this is actually exactly who i'm looking for do you ever have a way to think think through that angle i would say yes um it's it's more rare that we would turn a client away than it is turning an employee away. Um, but we do require consultation. So if they've never been to the salon before, we have them do a consultation with a stylist. Um, sometimes we will find that maybe there's a better fit stylist. So a stylist will say, you're here for this, but this other person on the team would probably be a better fit and we might switch that way. And then there are situations they're they're less personality based and more skill set based where someone comes in and they're asking for something that really is you know, unachievable or something that would damage their hair or their hair is just not right for what they're asking for. Um, and so yeah. in those situations, sometimes you have to just be very professional and honest about what you really can and cannot do. I'm picking up on this, you know, um, just really set out and manage expectations up front across the board, mm -hmm. whether it's teen or, or client. Um, mm -hmm. That seems to be one of the anchors that I'm, that I'm picking up from you. Yeah. Well, and I always say if you are upfront from the beginning, you're going to be the professional. If you go into it and you try, no matter how professional you are, and then you mess up and you have to course correct, all of a sudden you lose your expertise, even though the result is the same. If you yeah. can identify that and communicate that from the very beginning and they know what the risks are, and then if it does happen, they can say, you know what? She predicted that. She's a professional. She knows what she's doing. But if you do it in the aftermath, a lot of times it looks like you're just trying to cover your cover your but yeah <laughs> well let me let me maybe um flip to, to a, a different track mm -hmm. um the business owner of you right so we get a lot of questions from folks saying you know where is the next 10 percent of profitability that i can look for in my salon how to just grow the profit margins here and so knowing nothing more than that I mean, where are the first places that you know having done, gone through this where would you look if, you, if a salon owner is coming to you saying like how do i just Where's the low hanging fruit? Where are the kind of places that, that you start investigating? Yeah, um, I would say that the first two areas, I'm going to look at your operating expenses. So where are you spending money that you don't need to? A lot of times, I, this is kind of a joke that I say a lot, but a lot of salon owners are providing, you know, gourmet granola bars and LaCroix water, and yet they're not paying themselves. And I'm like, I get it. We all want a really high value customer experience, but at the same time, at what expense? Um, the second place I would say is a lot of times it's in payroll. I find a lot of salons have support staff that they feel is necessary. And really, it's just eating into the payroll, which, of course, anything that's, you know, eating into anything is really affecting your revenue and overall profit margin. So those are the first two areas that I typically look is your operating expenses and your payroll percentage. And what do you think are the most um, avoidable mistakes that salon owners make? as they start growing their business and finding, you know, a real place in the market that you just say, like, we, we all make this mistake. You know, don't, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> like it just always like, where, what do you think about that? I think number one is pricing. I think a lot of times when a salon owner opens, they're borrowing information that they've learned from places that they've worked before. And it's like, oh, well, this is what, or they're looking at other salons in the area. So they're like, oh, this is what they charge. That sounds about right. That's where we should be. But they're not taking a clear, hard look as, at as what it takes to run their business. And so there's so many different factors. And a lot of times I go through a process called understanding your business numbers and people are really falling short because they don't understand exactly what it takes to run their business. And if you don't have that understanding, you can't properly price your services to make sure that you're meeting those goals. And so you can't 
borrow that information. And a lot of times people will say, well, I just can't charge that much. And I'm like, well, you can't afford not to, you know, if you're, if you're in a business where you're not making a profit or paying yourself, really, what's the point of owning a business? <laughs> it's, it sounds obvious to so many of us on the outside, but I think when you're in the trenches, you know, I think there's, a, especially for people who are in the services, this, the idea of like self-sacrifice in the name of building the business and in the client's mm -hmm. name, it, it can become sabotaging over time. Like I've just seen that so many times over. Absolutely. And a lot of them, they're just so confused. They're like, I see there's money coming in. I just don't understand. Like there's, there's all of this money coming in, but there's nothing left at the end of the month. And I just don't know why. And, um, you know, the other mistake that I see that kind of correlates with that is they have accountants and bookkeepers who are doing P and L's for them. And they're really confusing bookkeeping with budgeting and they're not the same. So your bookkeeping is really the aftermath of what's already been done. And your budget is the before plan. It's making a plan for every dollar before you spend it. And a lot of business owners and especially salon owners, they're only looking at the aftermath. They're not taking the step of planning before they spend. And how did, how did you learn that? How did you learn the art of planning and the art of budgeting? It's much easier when you're two people, like when you got started, but now when you're dealing with many, many people, it's a complexity it almost blows up your mind sometimes. So how did you, how did you go through that and learn it? Yeah. If funny enough, when my son was in elementary school, it was another mom that I had met and she was like, I don't know. She was like Martha Stewart. Like her house was perfect. Everything was organized. She was so good about her schedule and like just everything in her life was so perfect. And we would just talk and she shared with me a budgeting software. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Tell me more about it. And she taught me how to use it. And I started using it at home first and in using it in my home life, I was like, wow, this could really be applicable to business. And so that's how I got started with the budgeting portion. And then throughout that, I've read a lot of books. Um, my favorite was Profit First. And so I read that book and, um, you know, it, it gave me a lot of valuable lessons, but most businesses are not like the salon world. The salon world is very unique. So I think if anybody just read that and didn't know how to make it their own, it wouldn't be as effective. But for whatever reason, between the training I had gotten with budgeting and the combination of using this book, I was able to create my own method and realize, um, you know, there was really a system to how you manage your finances. Yeah, well, I know Profit First very well. I, I love that book. Yeah, a copy of it here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a great um, book. Uh, one of the things that you see when you scale is you grow this concept of alumni, right? People who have kind of been as part of your business and then they go off. How do you um, how do you deal with the alumni of your business? You know, on the one hand, there could be wonderful, you know, shared memories. And the other hand, sometimes they go and compete right in your face. Um, tell me about your experience with watching people you groom and train go off on their own and maybe things you've learned along the way. Yeah. I mean, and it just depends because it's the phase of business, right? You know, in my earlier years is I took it very personally and, you know, had a lot of tears and emotion over it. But now looking back in hindsight, I kind of take a lot of blame for that. And I always say there's a lot of people that worked for me in my earlier years that have an opinion of me that I, I wish I could go back and say like, Hey, I, I, I've grown up. I'm better. I'm sorry for how I treated you because I only knew what I knew then. And I know so much better now. Um, at this point in my career, I really don't have people leave for those reasons. So I'm really lucky, but I think that comes down to really establishing my brand and my culture and my leadership and treating them like adults. So when they do leave, um, and I have had them, you know, like I just lost a couple last year, but they moved away. So it wasn't that they were leaving to go somewhere else. Um, yeah. I had a guy who left to open his own salon. And for me, it felt like I feel like you have to always put yourself in their shoes and their position, which is I once worked for someone before I rented a station, before I opened a salon. And like, I can't fault anyone for wanting their own growth journey. And if they're going off to grow, then I want to celebrate that and let them know I'm here to, you know, honor your efforts and support you. And funny enough, this one particular person tried it, hated it, did not like it, was like, this is not for me. They actually came back and they're working for me now still. So, um, you know, I think if you leave things on those types of terms and things don't work out, you never know, they might actually come back and want to work with you again. <laughs> that's quite, that's a, a nice way that the circle closes itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think there even, um, there is that level of self-awareness that they come back with or that mm -hmm. doubt in their mind of whether or not someone wants to go on their own. It's, they've done it. 
And now I think I've actually seen in those cases, like a level of commitment and a level of self-awareness that you just, mm -hmm. you just don't have until you've, you've gone through that part of the journey. Yeah. And, and appreciation, you know, it's like, I think this particular individual now has a whole new appreciation um, for what he had before. And like I said, he didn't leave on bad terms. He just wanted to grow. But now that he's back, yeah. he's like, wow, you never know what you've got until it's gone. So let me just take a, a last different angle. Um, what are the kind of ethical questions that a salon owner needs to work with? I know that's something that I've I've, I've heard you talk about, and so maybe you can kind of bring those into the light. I think it's just something that a lot of people maybe don't even realize that they're going through ethical decisions mm -hmm. and they should actually be aware of them and how they, they approach them. Yeah. I mean, I think that can apply in different ways, whether you're talking about team members or you're talking about clients. But I think the biggest thing is sometimes once we step into um, a, a leadership role where we own the business or even managers, I've seen this happen is like, you just, it, it's a different mindset where you feel like, oh, I'm in charge now. And it kind of shifts things and you get into that. It's business. It's not personal. And I strongly disagree with that with my years of experience. Now I do think it's personal. Um, now maybe a corporation is totally different than the small business, but in my world, you know, I always say, try your best to put yourself in that person's position and then give the answer that you would have wanted if that was you. And so sometimes, you know, where it comes with my team and making decisions, there's what's best for the business. And then there's mm -hmm. what's best for the person. And so I have to ask myself a lot, if I was this person standing here asking for this, what would I want? Not as the business owner, but as the person. And a lot of times it's a different answer of what I would do as an owner versus a person. Um, and, you know, you have to do that within limitations. So I think there's a lot of times where I, Kelly, the individual would love to say yes to something, but I could not say yes to everybody on my team. And that's mm -hmm. where ethics and integrity come in because, you know, you, you're kind of stuck in the middle, but I have to always go with, if I cannot say yes to everyone, I have to say no to the one. And that's where the integrity comes in. So, you know, you're always kind of playing in that role of what would I want as a person, but also could I do this for everyone if everyone was asking? And so that really helps you to back up your boundaries and your policies and your non-negotiables, whether it's a team member or a client. We find mm -hmm. it a lot with cancellation policy with clients. I find it a lot in, you know, kind of, um, I don't know, time off or policies with a uh, stylist. And so that's just the biggest piece for me is really looking at the human aspect of it, what it is that I would want, and could I be fair to everyone in this decision? Yeah, the, the idea of fairness, right? People maybe don't love the decision, but they at least understand why it happened. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of times I find that if I ask that question, they'll answer it for me. So I'll say, I really hear you, and I'm sorry you're going through that, and I wish I could do this. Let me ask you, what if your whole team members were asking for the same thing. Like, do you think it would be possible? And they'll say no. And I'm like, well, there's the answer. So sometimes I don't even have to be the one to answer it. You know, the answer presents itself. <laughs> it's like playing 3D chess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they made their own move. Yeah. Um, so Kelly, maybe uh, tell me finally, what are some of your favorite tools right now that, that you're using for your salon? You know, what would you want other folks in the industry to, to be aware of that you think are really supporting mm -hmm. you? Interesting. So tools could mean so many different things. Are we talking about like tools to run the business or tools for doing hair? <laughs> Take it wherever you want. Yeah. Anything um, that really comes top of mind is the, is the right answer. Yeah. Um, you know, I really am someone who keeps it very simple. I do not like to overdo it. So, I mean, I, the very basic tools in my business, I use a, a, a point of sales program called Vigaro, which really, you know, helps us to keep track of our schedule and pull all of our reports. Um, there's so many different ones out there. So that's really incredible. Um, and then, you know, using something like YNAB, which is the budgeting software that I use. I mean, those are really the two key pieces that I use to run my business. Other than that, a lot of the tools that I use, I've created myself because they just weren't out there. So I have a growth tracker um, that I created, and that really helps me to stay on track with my monthly goals, tracking my KPIs. I really like having it in a book form so that it's with me always. I don't have to get onto Wi-Fi and log in somewhere, I can just open it up and there's the information right there as I need it. Um, and then other tools that I use, again, things that I've created myself. I have a PDM form that I sit down with my staff every month. Um, I think that's critical to have that open conversation. So um, yeah, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I feel like a lot of it are things that I found that weren't out there that I needed and I created myself. It, there's a subtle... There's another subtle piece here, which I think you are extremely instrumented in measure, 
you know, it doesn't mean that you have to have the rocket ship, you know, calculating everything, but you're actually just the way you're talking about the, the way that you've measured and the way that you can take those measurements with you, your KPIs, your goals. I think that's just another thing that at least I've heard dawns upon people unexpectedly mm -hmm. saying like, I have to actually start really understanding all my numbers, my goals and tracking to them. And it sounds like you, you actually have a really simple system to get there for yourself. Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of coaching companies out there that they have a, mil a million KPIs. And I'm like, that's way too much. I don't think it needs to be complicated, but there are some really key numbers that you need to be aware of and be tracking on a regular basis. Um, I had a mentor in the industry that I was so lucky to learn under. His name was Nick Arojo. And he always taught me that what is measured can be grown. So if you don't know where you're at, there's no way to know where you're going. Um, and so that's why I think those tracking and numbers are so important. I hear you. Um, what are the, what are the top three numbers that that you that you look at regularly? Yeah, um, I am always looking at last year compared to this year just to see where the growth is. Um, I think another number that's really really important because payroll is such a huge number um, in the salon world is my payroll percentage, and that's a number that most salon owners that I talk to do not know, and they don't even know how to. Um, calculate that. But it's really important to know how much of your revenue is going towards payroll because after that is your what you actually have to run your business. So that's mm -hmm. really important. Um, and then I'm trying to go through my KPI list in my head. I mean, obviously profit margin is huge to know at the end of the month what's left over and um, what you have to work with there. So those would be my top three, but I have about 10 <laughs> that I track on a regular basis. Yeah. So 10 is the, 10 is the kind of simplified version for you. That's yeah. Your, yeah. That's your good thought. Yeah. Amazing. Kelly, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.